Okay, we are live. Okay, so welcome everyone to Touching the Art with Matilda Bernstein Sigmore and Mackenzie Wark. We're super happy to have you. Yes, give it up. My name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder of the Bureau of General Services Square Division, along with my partner, Dominic Jokum. And tonight we're being helped by two volunteers, Sylvia and Asudas. Thank you very much for that support. So the Bureau, as you probably know, is an all-volunteer organization. We've been around since 2012, and we've been here at the Center since 2014. And we survive in this hostile world by <laughs> taking donations and by selling books. So we have a suggested donation of 10 bucks, but we always say give what you can, if you can. And if you'd rather spend money on books than donating, that is perfectly fine. Um, but Whichever way you're able to support, we very much appreciate it. So I'll pass the bag around. There's some change in here. You can also Venmo us at BGSQD, those five letters all around you. So I'll pass this around. Oh, yeah. Uh, and if you're not already on our email list, you can sign up for that on our website, bgsqd.com, or at the back of the room on the sheet. And that is it for me. I'm just going to read a land acknowledgement before I introduce our two speakers. So the Bureau acknowledges that our organization operates on the unceded land of the Muncie Lenape. We encourage you to join the Bureau in signing up to make a monthly donation to the American Indian Community House's Manhattan Fund. The Manhattan Fund, according to its website, is an invitation to all settlers and non-Native people who wish to acknowledge the legacy of theft and genocide that comprise the history of New York City and the United States. And you can find out more at manahattafund.org. We also wanna recognize that today is the 103rd day of Israel's genocidal campaign against the Palestinian people, supported with our tax dollars and our government's unwavering support. We hope that you will join us in calling for an immediate, permanent ceasefire and an end to the siege and an end to the occupation in order to end the collective punishment of Palestinians and to ensure the swift delivery of much needed food, water, medicine, fuel, and medical aid to the people of Gaza. So Matilda Bernstein Sycamore is the award-winning author of The Freezer Door, a New York Times editor's choice, one of Oprah Magazine's best LGBTQ books of 2020, and a finalist for the Penn Jean Stein Book Award. Winner of a Lambda Literary Award and an American Library Association Stonewall Honor Book. She's the author of three novels and three nonfiction titles and the editor of six nonfiction anthologies, most recently, Between Certain Death and a Possible Future queer writing on growing up with the AIDS crisis. Sycamore lives in Seattle, and her new book is Touching the Art, out now from Soft Skull Press. And hold it. <laughs> Mackenzie Wark is the author, among other things, of Love and Money, Sex and Death, Raving, and Reverse Cowgirl. So we'll start with a reading from Matilda, and then Mackenzie will join Matilda in conversation afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's great yeah. to be here at the Bureau. And um, <clears throat> I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. I always like to say, whatever you need to do to take care of yourselves during the reading, please feel free to do it. So if you need to laugh, or cry, or jump up and down, or stretch, or take your shoes off, or buy 15 books, go to the bathroom, <laughs> all of it. It's all appropriate. The only bad audience is the dead audience. <laughs> and I can tell we're not going to be dead here tonight, so thank you for that already. 
Um, so touching the art centers around my relationship with my late grandmother, Gladys Goldstein, who was an abstract artist. Um, and it starts with me literally touching her art. So I'm touching these handmade paperworks um, to sort of feel what will come through. And what comes through starts, of course, with the art itself, continues with our relationship, and then uh, with the trauma and the possibility, um, and then goes from there into more uh, historical, structural, intimate, familial. It's all of it at once in certain ways. So I thought I would start just by reading from something from towards the beginning of the book. Um, so this is in the section where I'm literally touching the art. Um, and she was my father's uh, mother. Um, and um, maybe that's all the information you need to know so far. When I was a kid, and I knew I wanted to be a writer, Gladys told me that many of the best writers never got published. <laughs> so when I sent my poems to the Paris Review, <laughs> as a teenager, <laughs> because they said they wanted to discover new voices, <laughs> and of course they rejected my work, this did not discourage me. <laughs> Maybe it even made me more confident because so many of the best writers <laughs> never got published. <laughs> I don't know that Gladys said this to encourage me, but it was probably the best thing anyone could have told me. Publishing was something extra once places finally started accepting my work. It was exciting because I could connect with other writers and anyone who read my work, but it was not the primary reason for writing. That was just for me. It still is. In a Maryland public television show called Artworks This Week, Gladys says, I really cannot remember when I started to paint because I've always painted. This interview celebrates the opening of Gladys's collection at the University of Maryland in 2004. And here she is, painting in her studio on a canvas hanging from that same pegboard, now in her late 80s. I don't really feel that I'm an abstract painter, she says. I think that I'm a realistic painter because I'm painting what I see as a realistic meaning in art, which is the space that surrounds all of us. So that's what I'm painting. I'm painting the things between you and me. She's painting a realistic meaning. But how do you paint meaning? Abstractly. <laughs> if I'm painting the things between Gladys and me, is this the space that surrounds us. The title of Gladys's retrospective is Capturing the Essence. And she explains, how do you paint the wind? You capture the essence of that particular thing, or you try. I wasn't thinking about the wind, but then I put these two paperwork side by side, and I noticed there's a similar shape that dominates, or not a shape, but a counterclockwise circular movement at the top left. In one, the break is literally a rip in the paper. And in the other, the break is where the paper darkens. Does this look like a rip because of the other rip? Because of the lighting in my apartment right now? Or because of the light that Gladys wanted to come through? Coincidence creates a conversation between works of art. But also, art can be a conversation, if you're listening. And maybe even when you're not. As if paper can pull out of paper to become what? I have a collage 
in the entryway to my apartment right now. They used to be in Gladys's entryway. It's one of her most elaborate compositions. The layers of paper and glue bending the collage up toward the glass. So you can see the shape, the tension and extension. Matte browns and tans with flowers and foil and shapes on top. Words from cut up labels, articles from magazines, at least four language visible if you look close. But the language here is in the visual layering, the way each shape is cut apart to meet what it was cut from. Sometimes Gladys fell in love with the collage and realized, oh, there's a painting here. So she uses collage as a model for one of her largest paintings, a diptych that's 48 inches by 120 inches. I hold the image from the catalog up to the collage in my entryway that's about the same size as the reproduction or half the reproduction that spans two pages. And I can see how each segment is in dialogue with the matching segment on the left half of the diptych. Art as a container for art, or do I mean a container of art? Another letter. This one Gladys sent to me in East Boston in the summer of 1995. Oh no, the first sentence. Please write and tell me they are doing something meaningful. <laughs> I'm getting ready to confront my father about sexually abusing me. It's right around the corner. When I confronted him, I thought it would feel relief. But actually, where I felt relief was in the process of getting ready. He was screaming. He was calling me psychotic. He was saying I needed help. And I handed him what I'd written and said, everything I need to say is here. And then, he and then I walked away. I was worried he was gonna come after me. I was worried he was gonna attack me. I knew this was a childhood fear. And so I did not look back. Gladys writes, there was someone in my life who really changed it. His name was Hobson Pittman. I went to Penn State to study with him because I'd heard that he was a wonderful teacher and I was interested in the methodology of teaching. It was a toss up between him and Hans Hoffman. Hobson was the more liberal in his views. He told me I was an artist, a bona fide artist. I like the exclamation mark here, marking the disbelief turning into belief. Gladys continues, well, I had been to art school, been the best in my class, but that doesn't make one an artist. He was the first person and the only person who supported me in my beliefs. He asked to be the one to tell me when the university decided to buy one of my paintings. We became friends until the day he died. He was homosexual, but it never dawned on any of us to ever even think about that. The only thing that mattered was not only that he was a master teacher, but a wonderful human being and a very fine artist. Surely, Pittman's homosexuality mattered in the 1950s. To her, to the other students, to himself. Surely, this could have been part of what made him the wonderful human being who told Gladys that her art mattered. And, since she wasn't a sexual object to him, maybe this allowed him to see her in all her potential. To believe in the visual is a process that goes beyond the visual. Belief is a system, but it is also something beyond the system, something beyond belief. Gladys helped me to dream an everyday experience, to look at a flower and savor each element, to take it all inside. She helped me to imagine a world where everything else could and should be pushed away to make room for more imagination. She pushed the world away from me in those moments when we would go up into her studio, like up into the dream when it's no longer just a dream. I was awake and I was alive. 
I'm painting what exists between limbs of trees, space and sound, and everything that you can't really see with the naked eye, Gladys says. At least I think that's what I'm painting. And she looks at the camera so seriously here, a subtle smile. There's something plaintive in her gaze, but it's also commanding. She knows what she's saying. She's in control. Here's the painting on the cover of the catalog. Day Remember. Gladys is talking about what I keep calling windows or a frame, a broken or an open fence, a chain. Here she says, many, many years ago, I did paintings that had lines in them, linear movements all over, attaching things to one another. I felt that if you touched my life, then you are a part of it forever. That there was a string somehow or other that attached you to me. And I thought that if I could harness the geometric form within the feeling of my painting, then I would be able to be as emotional as I wanted and still have good spatial relationships within the painting. Is she talking about painting or her life? That string attaching. Sometimes it holds the paper together, but just barely. Sometimes the string is beneath the paper, a gash, or hanging off as ornamentation, or extending through a rip in the form at the top, like seagrass three, where there's the string inside, a cyclical motion undone. The string removed and only an indentation. The string covered and darkened. The string forming a border. The string bridging the rip at the top like hair. The string floating through. Suddenly, a soft bright blue, delicate, there for us in all dimensions. Life is very exciting, Gladys says, but it doesn't stay the same all the time. And I don't want to stay the same all the time. And yet, she wanted me to stay the same. Now Gladys is talking about how she started making candy wrappers after she had back surgery, when she couldn't do a lot of work standing. She says she wants to do something a little bit different than anyone had ever done before. I like the gem-like quality of the candy wrappers, so I keep it small. But each candy wrapper, even though they are very, very small, is a total painting. How Gladys changed her artistic process due to pain. It forced her to innovate. And how this happened for me too. 20 years ago, when my chronic pain first became debilitating and I couldn't write like I used to, in frantic bursts trying to get everything out. So I decided to write a few sentences a day with no intention of plot or structure. And after a few years, I was shocked to find that I had 400 pages. <laughs> And that text became my second novel. I love the tone in Gladys's voice when she says, I have candy wrappers. I'm gonna do candy wrappers. Suddenly high with excitement. Should I say childlike excitement? This is how I wanna feel all the time. <laughs> Now I want to welcome Mackenzie War up on screen. Oh, and I want to mention, oh, did you want to say something? Oh, she'll say hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Yeah. The more hugs, the better. Yeah. I wanted to mention that the candy wrapper collages that she made, that part of them is on the cover of the book. And one of the things I love is you can see some of the ingredients. So. Um, you can see, like, here's her Hershey label. Here it says, like, for information about this product, you know, just little pieces. Like, here's um, truffle. And so I really like it because it feels like you're actually touching the art. <laughs> I, I love chocolate and candy. So I, I just want to eat your book. That's <laughs> what that makes me want to do. Perfect. Yeah. I actually reread that exactly. Section. Oh, what a great coincidence. Oh, like because I read this book like before it was out, and then I'm like, oh, I, I should like look at it again. So I know what to ask. Perfect. About. I love it. Um, I'm just going to dive right into it. Yeah, absolutely. Really that sounded great. Um, it's it's like a book about um, 
among other things, aesthetic education. Mm. And I wonder how you see uh, sort of taking from, but also breaking from what Gladys mm. had to give you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, one of the surprises in the book, in writing the book, right? Because I always start a book, I don't have any intention about the structure or the form or where it's going to go. Now, in this book, I had an exploration, which I knew was about my relationship with Gladys, but I didn't know what direction that would take. And one of the surprises is, like, I had not really thought about some of the ways that she influenced my process that I, you know, I really had never thought about. It was just so integrated in my way of thinking. And the big irony, of course, is that, you know, later everything that I did became vulgar to her, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so I think the real break in terms of process is that in my work, I want everything to be integrated into it, like everything. Mm -hmm. Nothing can be left out. In Gladys's work, I think she was attached to this modernist idea of purity and this idea that, yes, you can, you can make work about your experience, but it shouldn't be explicit, right? And, and that certain things were vulgar. So sexuality was vulgar, you know, you certainly couldn't talk about sexual abuse, you know, queerness was vulgar, even if her best friends were queer, their work was abstract, right? Mm -hmm. And so their work, you know, they could, she had, you know, her best friend was a, a gay artist from Baltimore, Keith Martin. And I'm looking at photos of her from the 50s, and I realized, oh, there's Keith, there's her, my grandfather, my father, he's 13. And then there's like Keith Martin. And like, there's another man, it's Keith Martin's lover. And they're all together in the 50s, right? So she could integrate these people into her family in a certain way, even though I never knew about this, you know? But, um, but that, so I think the difference for me is I want everything in there all the time. And so when I'm writing the book and then the trauma comes through very fast and I did not, you know, I've written about my father sexually abusing me in most of my books, maybe all of them, right? But in this case, in the beginning, I was like, well, I just want to talk about my relationship with Gladys. And I was like, what's this doing in here? But I know it has to be in there, right? And so similarly, when, you know, I'm starting by talking about art and I end up talking about Jewish assimilation and white flight and disinvestment and, you know, segregation in Baltimore and all these big structural things, but it comes through actually touching the art, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so I think that's the, in terms of, pro, and also for me, I mean, it's, of course, it's a bit different because writing is words. I mean, Gladys sees words in her work too, but it was abstract. <laughs> so, you know, and my words are, there is abstraction in my work, but, but it also contains um, meaning, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and in a more direct way, I think language always is going to be, unless it's, completely deconstructed. Um, but um, but yeah, so I think I think that's the main difference. Like to me, writing, like I'm always drawn, like what I feel like I'm gonna die if I say it, that's what I have to say, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, and I think that in some ways those were the things that were vulgar to the politics as well as the sexuality, and even just existing in a way that confronts the world rather than creating your own, own world within mm. that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I wanted to pick up on abstraction too, because to me, there is a, like I felt there's something abstract about Frieza's or the mm. before this one. Mm -hmm. And after reading this one, I'm like, oh, to what extent, you know, in the sense, it's not a book with a beginning, middle and end, like yeah. Harry Potter, you know, mm -hmm. like you <laughs> take time to like pause and look at things and to see things in the world mm -hmm. and that happens in both these books and, and in your early books as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, to what extent do you think there is an abstraction and maybe Gladys was one of the, the sort of formative experiences that gave you the, the ability to sort of see and work in that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I do think that, yeah, because to her, <laughs> yeah, a little pause. <laughs> um, so her, yeah, abstraction, any work that was figurative or especially um, representational in kind of a literal way, to her was like worthless, you know? And, and so I grew up with that mentality. So, and I think also just her way of existing in the world was, you know, or at least the, her self-perception or, or what she projected to the world was, was that, 
everything with art, right? You know, you go outside and there's a candy wrap on the ground and it's reflected in the light and you're like, wow, look at that work of art, right? You know, a decaying leaf is a work of art, you know? Um, and so this coincidence is, is part of um, directness, right? And um, and I feel like why I didn't I didn't know this as a child, but I think that is where I, where I learned um, that kind of method, mm -hmm. and um, and I do think that when I'm writing, you know, I want to um, allow all of that in, right? So like something comes onto the page that I don't expect. And then maybe doesn't even, you know, like in the book, I'm walking down the street in Baltimore and there's a naked guy walking down the street and, and I'm like, hi, what are you up to? And, you know, and, <laughs> um, and then, you know, we like hug in the middle, it's like sweaty, it's like summer in Baltimore. And, and like someone might say, well, that doesn't belong in this book, right? But I'm in Baltimore to touch the art, right? And, <laughs> and that, that, that means like experiencing the world and all of its ramifications. And and so, and I think in some ways that is abstraction, sure. right? Yeah, but there's a way in which, uh, I mean, we're similar in a, in a sense of being, in a sense, like spawn of people who believed in modernism, mm -hmm. such as my family too. Mm -hmm. But what interests me in this book is you've put in all the things in, that were around Gladys that she had been awarded to, to have that aesthetic mm -hmm. that I think we can't ignore. Mm -hmm. So you get into... The segregation in Baltimore, Jewish assimilation, and the ambiguities and complexities of that, uh, her sort of non relation to feminism mm -hmm. and competitive relation to other women, mm -hmm. maybe, and, and that homosexuality can't be explicitly, it has to be disavowed, it has mm -hmm. to be seen as not seen, and all that. So, uh, I hate these long rambly things that don't really. I love that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wonder is this book then a sort of like working through of how you be after modernism, but still honor it in a way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's also, you know, like we're told that that we should never touch the art, right? Mm -hmm. Art is something pure, you know, exists on the wall. We maybe have a gate, we might have a few guards. The more valuable it is. If it's not valuable, then, it, you know, maybe you can touch it, but if it's valuable, right? Like, and, and so I think that that gated mentality actually damages the art. And it damages like our potential to to feel it, right? And I think um, so for me, and I think also this this uh, the and I think that in terms of modernism, right? There's that that purity part of the part that I think is the problem, right? And I think of course there are all different ways to like interpret it, but and also right this idea that art can exist without the context and. To me, so like when I, like, for example, I go to Baltimore, I move there for eight months because I realized this is the city that formed Gladys and I have actually not lived in Baltimore. I grew up in DC, I went there as a kid, but I had like very specific, you know, like I went to her house, I was forced to go to Baltimore Orioles games, I went to the <laughs> aquarium, you know, like a few galleries, but I didn't know Baltimore, right? So, and part of that was to sort of like experience the city on my terms. Part of it is to like look at very specific things, like an archive of her papers um, or her press clippings. You know, this is the Baltimore Museum of Art, or um, a oral history of the Jewish Museum of Maryland, or go to her house, talk to her students. Um, but part of it was just what would come through in Baltimore, mm -hmm. and like you know, some of the things. Well, one of the first things to come through was seeing the ways that that art or artists are used really so blatantly as tools of gentrification, and in a very top-down mentality. Now that happens everywhere, but in Baltimore, it's like arts district. And then there's like $18 million to renovate a theater, but across the street, you know, um, people are nodding off, you know, from decades of lack of access to resources, right? And also thinking about Gladys and, you know, like when I asked her as a kid, or not as a kid, but um, maybe like when I was, I'm not sure, you know, maybe 20 or something, like, do you ever go back to the neighborhood where you grew up? And she said, you can't, right? And, and I thought, well, what is that? You know, I said, what do you mean? And she said, you just can't. And I knew she meant that she never went back because it was a black neighborhood, right? It become a black neighborhood. And that meant that she could never go back, right? That's that racist mentality of Baltimore, of, you know, the segregated mentality that 
that exists to this day, you know, and and in, not just Baltimore, right? It's the whole country, right? But um, but for me, that's part of the art, right? You can't separate them. Or even like, you know, so her path as a child, you know, she lived um is the path essentially, you know, like uh growing, you know, in the sort of a Jewish family like assimilating into middle class existence. You know, her father worked at the AMP, uh, which at that time could be a comfortable job. No longer, obviously, but um, you know, and they their path was like Northwest Baltimore, which was where Jews could live, right? And Jews were banned from from owning property or living in most of Baltimore. Now, as they moved this particular path of white flight, because they could only go in one direction, right? Those were the neighborhoods that became black neighborhoods, right? And Jews were both um, victims of a kind of segregated, you know, housing policy and also benefited, right? And because they still own the property and would rent them at these exploitative rates, you know, to black people who moved into these neighborhoods. And so for me, like all of this has to be in the book. Like this, this legacy of Baltimore is the legacy that formed Gladys. And even if she was very sophisticated in certain ways, like this racist mentality, this segregated mentality, like her homophobia was in some ways liberal for that time or liberated. It's relative. Yeah, because <laughs> she's like, oh, you know, you can be gay. It's just not important, right? <laughs> <laughs> So like Robert Rauschenberg and the TL, yeah. <laughs> with like you know I asked her what you know what is what about these people who are her contemporaries essentially she says oh well they're they're very important artists right but the fact that they're gay doesn't matter you know and so so all of those things like as I'm writing the book they have to be in the book you know mm -hmm. and so uh, for me and I think that in some ways it, you know to, to disrupt that sort of myth that art is something pure, right? But also to be in the art, right? To actually experience it, right? Not just as something that's on the wall or that's gated, but like an actual like lived experience of the world. I wanted to ask you about uh, risk. One of the people who, who had written about Gladys but, and she rejected the, mm. the writing as I recall is, is like, well, there are risks she wouldn't take. Mm -hmm. This is sort of uh, a pulling back. But I, I wonder how much your sort of moving away from that background was about taking risks mm -hmm. aesthetically and, and also in how one lives one's life. Mm -hmm. and, so that, and then, so to me, the book is maybe having taken those risks and looking back on, and, and quite sympathetically on Gladys, as mm -hmm. someone who's restrained by a fear of risk, maybe. Mm -hmm. How's that? Lens reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that certainly for me, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I love that you got, so there was when she had this uh, retrospective, mm -hmm. someone wrote the catalog copy, but and by wrote the catalog, I mean, he spent a year with her, mm -hmm. like went over her house, yeah. you know, like, and then he wrote it and she's like, this is wrong. And then, you know, and I talked to this person, you know, that's where I got this information. And and I kept, he's like, oh, I have it here somewhere. He never said it to me, right? Um, you know, and um, the catalog copy as it exists now is really interesting because for a few reasons. One reason is it never mentions, um, it's all centered around her art, which is obviously what she wanted, right? Because now I know that they reject, she rejected the other copy, right? So I don't know what exactly was in that unless, it is funny because mysteriously this Wikipedia entry appeared and it's very researched. It's like, and I was like, whoa, who did this? Mm -hmm. And I kind of wonder that if that is the catalog copy, like, yeah. if, you know, because, but I don't know for sure, because mm -hmm. it's very researched and it also does say that same thing mm -hmm. where she saw herself as a regional painter mm -hmm. and which I'm not sure it's true. Like, I mean, she definitely saw herself as a Baltimore painter, but, you know, she had a career here in the fifties and some, you know, and then it sort of it became more regional after that, for, after the 60s, you know, and which is the same moment as women artists are being pushed out of the center. So it's not just her, you know, I, you know like, um, but, but I think that question about risk, yeah, and I think, yes, because the thing that, um, you know, when I confronted my father about sexually abusing me, like, um, or I guess even before that, I guess it was even... But, but around that same time. Yeah, even before that, it was like, I was like, I knew that I hated my parents. I knew that him in particular. And 
um, because of his rage and how he controlled everyone in the family and that sort of misogynist uh, and that myth of upper mobility that kept me like sort of stuck. But I didn't realize the depth of it, right? Until I remembered I was sexually abused. So maybe it was around then when I was about 19, that's when I remembered. And for me, but I know actually it started before then because it was when I was 12 or 13 that I was like, oh, I don't respect them at all, my parents. I'm never gonna have a relationship with them again. And, but I had, had to have a relationship, which was the, the, you know, of them supporting me, um, or I believed that I had to have that relationship. Mm -hmm. And I also had internalized that upper mobility myth. So I was like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do better than them, right? I'm going to go to better college. I'm gonna like, you know, have a more unloving marriage and live in a, you know, like a bigger house, you know, and hate my life more than that. And then I won. And, that's what I won. and then I was like, I, you know, I left DC when, you know, and I did go to a better college, whatever the hell that is. And and then I was there and I was like, wait, I'm just learning to, to outdo them on their terms. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, you know, when I was 19, I left. I was like, I need to get the fuck out of here. Moved to San Francisco. It's like I need to find, you know, radical queer activists, you know, and that meant like activists and uh, freaks and you know dykes and fags and like weirdos and vegans and yeah. and dropouts and incest survivors and oh, yeah. and that was what I was going to learn from, right? Mm -hmm. And so and that was it. Did completely that was the moment of of the end of my relationship with Gladys in, in a meaningful way, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, because she couldn't understand that. And I couldn't understand how she couldn't understand that, right? So, because to me, I believed her like myth, right? That, that, that everything was ours. And I was like, but wait, I'm living that, I'm living that, right? This is what means, you know, something to me, our activism, you know, you know, building relationships outside of mainstream norms, but she believed in those norms. So, but I I believed so much in the in the myth that I was like I just thought she would immediately understand you know and and that was actually when I left school it was like which was before I confronted my father but before I remembered him that he sexually abused me but and then I confronted him when I was twenty one but the me leaving school was the first, the biggest falling out with Gladys because she and she tried to like renounce her entire life she was like if I could do it all over again I would have finished school and I was like. What do you mean? You know, you would not have become an artist. Like that is that what you're saying? And and I was I was so offended by that. You know the 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 hypocrisy of that. Like I didn't believe that she actually believed that. But it was like, and I think that yeah. And so and so and and then things like uh, and so I, but also I didn't hide anything from anyone in my family because I was like. I don't, they, they can either accept me on my terms or just don't, you know, it didn't really, so that because of that, like it gave me a kind of freedom. And so like, you know, when I started turning tricks, you know, as, to make a living when I was 20, like they knew that, right? They're like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm turning tricks, you know, I'm a hooker. And they're like, what do you mean? And like, so the, and that of course was vulgar, right? And like, um, so, but it, but it was interesting because that was that wasn't what she usually said was vulgar. Because of course we didn't talk about that directly. I mean, I did, but they wouldn't like, you know, they would just say like, "There's a problem" or something. You know, but the problem was they had to bring me back to the family. That was how they would phrase it, right? And so when I confronted my father, they found like a false memory syndrome specialist, I right? Read those pages again too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so, so yeah, I do think. I do think, and this is something I realized in writing the book. So when Gladys was basically, she grew up in this, you know, a family sort of moving into the middle class. And, but when she was uh, 13, she met, she and her best friend, they met these like a little bit older, like 16 and 18 year old Jewish boys who were like sons of someone who became a millionaire during the depression. So like super rich. And they were essentially married into like arranged marriages. Like they knew them for five years and when they turned 18, they married them, you know? Mm -hmm. And Gladys divorced, like moved, got into that marriage, which she never talked about. Like I knew she had a marriage, but she was just like, it was a mistake, you know? And she, after two years, she got divorced and then she was banished essentially because divorce was so like in Baltimore at that time in the world that she was in, 
you know, she moved to Florida, she met another wealthy Jewish, you know, son of a department store uh, owner, and then they, she was in love with him, and then uh, they found out she had been divorced, and they banished her from there. And so one thing I realized in writing the book is, or I wonder, I guess, is like, this is the same time when I'm rejecting everything in order to create my own life. Mm -hmm. Now, she was rejected, so it's the other direction. Mm -hmm. in the Although it started with her choosing her own autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. She was like, get me out. And like, I talked to her. One of the things that was really amazing writing the book, I found her best friend um, from childhood who was 101, and she was like completely cogent. And she's like telling me all these things I would never, like all that, I would not have known otherwise, you know? And, um, but so, yeah. And so, so I realized like maybe one of the things that was so threatening to her, now I don't know, but it's something to think about, was that I was doing what she had done in a certain way, a different time, different way. And instead of wanting to protect me and nourish that, she wanted to punish it, right? So it's like she internalized that sort of worldview. And to her, middle-class respectability is where she created art. To me, it was what would kill me. Yeah. It already had killed me, you know? Like if I hadn't gotten out, it, you know? And so, so, and that was, you know, in some ways, the terms of our bond. I got one more, then I'm going to ask people if there's any questions from the audience. So you might want to think about that now, because I'm going to come, come back for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so circling back to thinking of Gladys in terms of that post-war suburban mm -hmm. modern life and then modernist art that you, in a sense, sort of learn from in some ways fulfill and break with at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the book's like beautifully subtle about those relationships, mm -hmm. the learning from and breaking with at the same time. But how is the next generation of writers and artists going to break from us? Mm -hmm. What's that going to look like, you think? Because they're going to have to do that too. Mm -hmm. right. I don't understand Sycamore and Walk and all that. <laughs> but yeah, what's it going to look like? I mean, I guess for me, aren't we always, always breaking from one another? Like, <laughs> isn't, I think that that writing, for me, I, I think I always believe like writing on your own terms, mm -hmm. right? And your own terms, whatever they are. Like for some people, and, and moving toward, um, I guess, impossibility, right? Even more than possibility, right? It's like, like what you can't imagine. And I think that, I don't know, in the generational sense, it's interesting because the book is very generational, right? Um, but in terms of, um, it's hard for me to think in such a broad way because there are people that are always retrograde. You know, they could be 20 or they could be 100, right? And there are people who are always challenging the norm. And, and so I don't, like, I think it's only when you look back that you can kind of see, at least in my way of thinking, that, oh, here was something that happened, right? Like, let's say people look back at the early 90s, which to me, you know, it's like kind of like yesterday, but it's also <laughs> when I was 19. <laughs> and I'm like, but it's like, and people look at it and they're like, oh, there are these things that were so possible. And sure, some things were possible that are not possible now. But also everyone was dying of AIDS and drug addiction and suicide. And that was what made those things possible, right? And so it's that sort of, and so I think that sometimes when people think about the future, it's nostalgia and reverse, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's just as, you know, like limited, right? And so for me, I guess, so I, so I don't know, I'd rather just let it happen, right? <laughs> and I think that, and I think it's always happened. You know, I think even in our own work, we're breaking from our own work in order to create something that's shifting and moving in different ways. All right. So, any thoughts out here in the audience? Uh, uh, Greg, do we have a mic for people in the audience, or shall I relay the question yeah, for people uh, online? Yeah, Thank yeah, how about it at the back there? Hi, uh, my name is Derek Marshall Newman, and I've known Matilda British for how many years? Um, I met you in 1990 at Clear Nation, so I'm wondering, I have two quick questions. One is, was that the year that you were 2021 20, or were you older, younger in 1990? Because that was the year we were in Queer Nation together in San Francisco, where we, we were meeting those freaks that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, like the timeline there. Um, and the second question is, 
Um, I want to write a memoir about my life, but my problem is that the molestation didn't come from my father, it came from my older brother, and mm -hmm. he's still alive. How do you navigate writing a book about somebody who's still alive if they're going to sue you or, you know, <laughs> silence you in other ways when you still uh, want to kind of maintain a, uh, a fair relationship with them, even though there's all this hurt and you want to confront them, and yet you know if you cut that part out of your memoir, then no one's going to think it's juicy or they're not <laughs> going to buy it or... I don't know. I mean, there's so many weird problematic strands of my childhood that are related to his abuse, and I want to express them in writing, and I'm very confused when I'll ever write this memoir because I'm getting old. <laughs> okay. very, just, very just sum that up first for people who uh, are online. Uh, writing about uh, people who may have been abusive but who are still alive is, is the second part. And the first part had to do with a little more detail about Matilda's era in Queer Nation in San Francisco. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so I moved to San Francisco in 1992, so we couldn't have met until then. <laughs> <laughs> so that that would be the answer to that. And also, I was not in Queer Nation, so it would have had to have been ACT UP. Um, and um, but I actually remember meeting you here in '97. Um, so perhaps, well, we might have met back then as well, but. It, but it would have been in ACT UP, or it could have been, because yeah, because Queer Nation was just ending, essentially, when I moved there. Um, it was only a few, I think about six months later, it was over. Yeah. Um, so, um, and so the question about writing about an abusive family member when they're still alive. So I've, I've written about my father um, in all of my books, you know, including when he was alive, um, you know, about him sexually abusing me. Um, and, but I think that, and that, so I guess my answer really is that the most important part is to write it, right? Mm -hmm. For yourself mm -hmm. and to write everything, everything, like on your own terms, you can do whatever you want to do with it later and think about all those other questions, you know, and, and I'd be happy to chat about that at any point, but I think, I think too often we're limited by thinking about what other people are going to think. And, and it stops us, especially if it's an abuser, you know, it stops us from actually expressing ourselves. And, and I also think, in my experience, it's really surprising what people do and do not react to, you know? Like, there are people I've written about in ways that are like, you know, very complicated and, you know, positive and negative, who love it. And they want every, they're like, put in every terrible thing that ever happened. They love it, you know? 